I am a head of design for the government digital service, which sits within the cabinet office. This uh, is a tweet by the Reverend Dan Cat, who's one of the original developers at Flickr, and then he went on to be a developer at The Guardian in the UK. He tweeted this in January last year. Um, it's very flattering, it's not really true, I don't think, but something interesting is going on in the UK government called the Government Digital Service, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that this morning. For those of you that don't have an intimate knowledge of UK politics, uh, the Cabinet Office is basically number 10 Downing Street, it's that bit. Um, it sits at the very heart of government, and the job of Cabinet Office is to make government work better, and we are the bit that does that digitally. So, all this began when uh, Martha Lane Fox, who's a, a dot-com entrepreneur, I guess, she um, started a website called lastminute.com, which I don't know if everyone will be aware of outside of sort of the UK and Europe, but she started lastminute.com, um, and it, she's, uh, they floated that, and she's left that now, but she's a kind of internet entrepreneur. She was asked by the government to look at all digital stuff and write a report on all government digital stuff, everything really, all the websites, everything. Um, she wrote that report. That report was called Digital by Default, um, and in that report, she called for, she was really clear, and she called for revolution, not evolution. She said, you know, we need a huge change. Uh, this stuff isn't working at the moment, and we need a huge change to make this work, not just small evolution. Specifically, she recommended four things. One was to set up government digital service, and she said it, it, there's loads of brilliant uh, design and digital talent in the UK. We should set something up inside government that, that gets some of these people. Uh, two was to fix publishing. So publishing is, is uh, government websites. The two huge ones, by far the biggest ones uh, in terms of reach in the UK, are DirectGov, which deals with most of the citizen needs. How do I get my kid to school? What kind of taxes do I need to pay? Um, and Business Link, which, as the name would suggest, gives kind of business advice. Um, but then there's all the department sites as well. Each department has got its own website and so on and so on. That's what we mean by publishing. Three is fixed transactions. So that's the actual transaction of paying your car tax online um, and actually other transactions that aren't online that need to be if we follow the digital by default um, method. And then four, go wholesale, which um, we're kind of coming to that bit, no one really knows quite what that means, but it sort of means make this data available, make APIs and let people build stuff with you know, government data and stuff, that's kind of what that means. But those are her four key uh, recommendations. Um, that report was uh, approved, by, agreed by all the ministers, signed off, and is being put into action. GDS, um, there was a little kind of skunk work style project going on with about six people just to make some proof of concept stuff to sort of show people that it wouldn't be too scary what we were doing. But GDS really started in November 2011. So all the stuff I'm about to show you is kind of um, been done in just about a year, I guess. And one of her recommendations was that we make a single place for all government services and information online. So government had, at the time, over 2,000 websites. We are making one. And she also said um, that cabinet office should have absolute control of, of the overall user experience across all digital channels. This is fantastically useful to me, because to me, this is the line in, in the report, and it's an official thing signed off by ministers. This is the line that does design, really. That's the, the only sentence we need, really. It gives us the kind of authority and power and the justification for design and so on and so on, just in that sentence. And there's a, a paragraph that follows that that says the user experience must be good and um, people shouldn't have to relearn. You know, if you're booking a prison visit, that should be the same as booking a driving test. You shouldn't have to relearn how to do these things. But that one sentence, I think, is really important um, from a design point of view. Um, I used to be head of design at Wyden & Kennedy, which some of you have heard of as an American ad agency that has offices all around the world, and I was head of design for the, the London one. Um, and when I started this job at the Government Digital Service, it's kind of, you know, different <laughs> from working in an ad agency. Um, but one of the things I was struck by, uh, around about the same time as I started this job, there was an exhibition at the Design Museum um, of Kenneth Granger's work, someone who Michael and, and Paula will know very well. He's one of the early Pentagram partners. Um, and the thing that strikes you from that exhibition is just how much of the sort of fabric of Britain, I guess, he designed from some of the things you can see there, you know, Kodak camera that you think, I remember my mum and dad having that, and there's an electric heater that I remember my gran had in a room, and there was a razor that I think I might have started shaving with, and, you know, there's other stuff. Um, 
But there was trains and post boxes and bus shelters and black cabs. And, you know, that's what I mean by the sort of fabric of Britain. You'd see this stuff everywhere. Um, and there was lots of sort of, the, you know, public service, sort of public sector design like trains. And the black cab isn't, isn't quite public sector, but that kind of post boxes and bus shelters, you know. And that, it just struck me that um, in Britain, we used to be really good at this. We used to be really good at big public sector design projects. I mean, we, we used to lead the world, really. Um, and then we kind of lost our way, I think, in the late 80s, certainly in the 90s. We kind of lost our way a bit. Um, and so I wrote a little document. I just screen grabbed this on the plane because it's, it's a PDF. It doesn't really make sense in a presentation. But I wrote a little document for um, the boss and just said, I think this is probably the best brief in Britain. Um, and if we, can, with, if we take that line of, of the two lines from Martha's report about user experience and about um, you know, making one, one single domain and creating that consistency, um, if we get this right, if we can look at some of the, these projects in the past and achieve or get close to achieving some of the stuff they did, this really, could, you know, this really is the best brief in Britain. It's fantastic. Um, so Joseph Bazalgette, who kind of invented the sewers, I mean, there was some before, but um, a big Victorian uh, project in London. It's a fantastic public sector, public service um, you know, design project that was copied around the world, and it's beautiful as well as useful. This is Crossness Pumping Station, which is in South East London. You go inside it, it's incredibly beautiful, and it's just a sewerage, you know, sewerage system. Um, the other one, a really obvious one, and, and lots of you are graphic designers, so I apologise if I'm you know, boring you a little bit here, but there is the tube map. So the tube map, you know, um, by Harry Beck and Johnson and, and lots of other public servants involved in that, not just one designer. But the tube map in the 30s in London, you know, before it was like a traditional map, and they invented this diagrammatical way of doing it, they set the standard for that. Um, it's the first time that had ever been done, and it's so brilliant, and it seems so obvious now, it's invisible. You know, you just for completely forget that exist, you don't see it anymore. Um, but it's a wonderful uh, public service design project that set the standard and was copied around the world. This is Moscow. This is Tokyo. This is Cape Town. Um, so I, I think that's interesting. Um, the other one that is an incredibly similar story to what we're doing is the UK road signs. So the UK road signs were designed in the late 50s, 60s. It took about 10 years to kind of finish the whole uh, project. But um, there was a huge explosion in road vehicle traffic. The government decided to build motorways, which are the, you know, the equivalent of freeways, um, that would span the length of the country. And before, each town kind of had their own road signs. They were sort of similar, but effectively, each town could make their own road signs and do whatever they wanted. And the government realised this would be chaos. We can't have somebody driving from London all the way up to Edinburgh and having different signage, you know, all along the way. Um, so they commissioned Jock Kinnear and Margaret Calvert to do this project to make one uh, unique system. It's a, a, you know, it's a textbook example of graphic design, and you, you know, get taught at college. It's a wonderful example. They did the blue and white ones and the motorway ones, and then they did more um, kind of local roads, which are the sort of green and white ones which you see. Um, but again. They set the standard. This project was copied around the world. There's slightly different road signs in, in Germany and Switzerland because there's competing typographic factions at the time. But effectively, uh, this project was copied globally. This is Abu Dhabi. This is Greece. And as I spotted on the way in from the airport, this is Cape Town. So there's, you know, there's a few slight differences, but broadly speaking, they, they set the standard and this project was copied around the world. Um, What's really interesting about the road signs is they, each town had its own road signs and they designed one system. And if we go back to that report that we should create a single place for government services and information online, it's just incredibly similar um, to what we're doing. And the way they were set up um, inside the civil service and working with departments and ministers, uh, um, there's a lot of similarities there between what we're doing. So that single place for all government services and information online is called gov.uk. We launched... Um, we launched a beta version of that in January. We made various changes throughout the year, all in public. It's all open. Everyone could see it. That's sort of why we do alphas and betas. And then we launched it on October the 17th. Um, so we switched off DirectGov and BusinessLink, which are the two huge UK government websites. Um, 
Now, there's no way to do this without showing you screenshots of websites, which is an awful thing to do at a presentation. Um, and it never really works. And you know, they don't quite look right in the PowerPoint and so on and so on. So I've got two little videos that I'm just going to play you. Um, they're very short, sort of 30 seconds, that just explain um, a bit about the website. Gov.uk is a new website that will be the best place to find government services and information. From the 17th of October, it will replace DirectGov and BusinessLink. Gov.uk will make it simpler, clearer and faster for people to get what they need from government. It's got some step-by-step -step guides for things like employing new staff, which can make some complicated processes much easier to understand. You can work out things like maternity pay with the help of some very simple tools. And for things like bank holidays, we put the information most people are looking for right in the middle of the page. Gov.uk. It's simpler, clearer and faster. Have a look at www. Gov .uk. So we launched that in October and then a month later we started closing department sites. So each department has some website, we're closing those, we're folding those in. There are over 400 of those departments and agencies. Um, just today we've um, done another one and kind of folded that in. That means we've now done tw 12 of 24 ministerial departments um, are pulled into that. And by April all the ministerial departments um, will be on gov.uk. And there's another little video to explain that. Central government in the UK is made up of around 400 organisations. Each of these have websites where they publish information about who they are and what they do. We're bringing all of these websites together onto a single place on gov.uk. Some have already moved. More will be joining soon. When we've finished, you won't need to know which bit of government does what in order to find out what government is doing on any given subject. Announcements, publications and policies will all be together in one place. You can still look up information about a specific government organisation. Or you'll be able to see things from lots of organisations gathered together around topics, like everything on climate change or everything relating to crime and justice. Inside Government makes it simpler, clearer and faster to find out how government works, see who is working on what and stay updated when things change. See for yourself at www.gov.uk forward slash government. So um, I talked before about how this is similar to the road sign uh, project in Jock Kinnear and Margaret Calvert. Jock Kinnear uh, sadly passed away about 10 years ago, but Margaret Calvert is still alive. And she taught at the Royal College of Art for about 20 years. I was thinking, someone I know must know her. You know, it'd be great to speak to her. Someone I know must know her. Turns out just about everyone I know knows her. Um, and loads of people put me in touch with her, which is fantastic. And she's become a uh, kind of unofficial mentor um, stroke fierce critic of um, you know, the project. And she comes in and, and speaks to me and, and speaks to the team. And, and you know, we do this stuff, um, which is fascinating. And she's, I think partly because she taught at the Royal College of Art for so long, she's great at giving feedback. Feedback isn't easy to give, um, but she gives you know, very constructive, uh, helpful feedback. Um, and one of the things we're doing, you, they sort of talked about it in the video there, but this is the old site before. So this is DirectGov, um, the one that we turned off in October. Um, and it, it, wasn't act, it wasn't actually that bad. What, what happened was that the way the site had been built and procured, you couldn't change it for two and a half years. So it was sort of procured on a five-year contract with one change in the middle. So if you think, you know, five-year contract for a website, five years ago, they'd only just launched the iPhone. You know, we had no iPads. If you make a website in that way is crazy, really. So um, it was just that it kind of was five years out of date. And in terms of web, you know, in terms of uh, the internet, that's a really, really long time. But this is the page that tells you about when the clocks go forward and back and when the bank holidays are. And what we can tell um, from uh, search logs and Google and things like that is when people look for bank holidays, what they really mean is when is the next one. It, So we just made that huge and put that in the middle, really. Um, you, you can't see on that, uh, that's what I mean about screenshots, right? You can't see under that, but underneath that, it does tell you when all the other ones are. So um, it's important, uh, you know, government sets the bank holidays and some of them move. If Christmas Day is on a Saturday, the uh, corresponding bank holiday will move and government decides that. So it's important that we tell you that information and, and it, we tell you for about the next three or four years. Um, and again, that's important because, you know, if you were organising a wedding, uh, um, 
next summer, or if you were thinking, I'm going to renovate that restaurant, I'd like to open it on Bank Holiday Weekend. You know, it's important that you know when that information is. So that information is there, but that one tells you when the next one is, which is what people want to know. And then you can also add that to your iCal and you know, all that kind of stuff and do it automatically. Um, but this is the kind of section coming up for the type geeks now. Um, so that's, that's, um, all these screenshots are from this morning, by the way, because so the site design changes quite a lot, actually. So that's from this morning. Um, that's an early version. Of that. That's the clocks change one, but it's the same design pattern, basically. That's an early version of that. Um, showed that to Margaret Calvert, and she said, that page makes me feel sick. <laughs> and she said to me, why is that box pink? And I said, well, you know, we, we found out that, again, same with the clocks for when people search, arrive at our site via Google, they search for, you know, when do the clocks go forward, what, you know, what they mean is the next, when's the next time, when do they go forward, they don't to know that. That's the key important information that people want, so we put that in a big pink box in the middle. So he's like, yeah, yeah, I get that. Why is it pink? And I was like, well, you know, we really wanted to highlight it and we really wanted to, um, you know, pull that out, so we put it in a big pink box. Like, yeah, yeah, I understand that. Why is it pink? <laughs> well, we wanted it to be bright and stand out. Um, and she's like, yeah, so why is it pink? I don't, no, no, don't know why it's pink. Um, and she just, you know, it's kind of obvious, but it was really helpful to have her to f make us, force us to think about some of those decisions. And why one of the things she made us do was go back and set everything we were working on the website in one typeface and one colour, so and one type size. So um, that's and that's you know kind of little experiments or sketches I guess that we did um, and that's one of those. So that's just one typeface, just one size, and it's just black and white. And what that forces you to do is to really look at the content, I think, and really say, okay, we're going to because design can allow you to hide things as, as well as highlight things. And you know we we'll go and talk to the content people and say, you know, this text was really small before because we were hiding it. Do we need to make it more important, or do we need that text at all? And how do we highlight things if we haven't got size and colour? Well, we can use kind of grey boxes and black bars and capital letters and things like that. But you know, how are we going to do that? Um, and there's another one there. Where we've got three type sizes. It's the same thing, but there's three type sizes. And then we added a, a tiny little bit of colour for that one. Um, but why that's interesting is um, what Margaret is brilliant at is. And what they did with the road signs is she tells, there's got, she's got hundreds of these stories, but one she tells is, is this story. One of those arrows, the one on, the, on your, that one. <laughs> that one takes your brain half a second or something, half a second less time to read than the other one. So the other, you could argue that the other one is better visually, but the other one is slightly quicker for your brain to read. When you're driving down a motorway at 70 miles an hour at night in the rain, that is absolutely vital. You know, that could be, that could be crucial. Um, and she's brilliant at, at kind of getting us to think like that and, and do like that. And she's got lots of good stories like that. And it's because of that that we started calling this a sort of information design project. You know, it's not graphic design, it's not web design, it's information design. What people want is the information. So, you know, we're designing for that information. Um, and we had lots of phrases around the office, and, and this is one I particularly like. Remember, we're designing information, not pushing pixels around a screen. I think too many web designers are guilty of this. You fire up Photoshop, you get some pixels, and you just nudge them around, push them around, till it looks like it looks a bit all right over there. Just put it over there, you know. And we have to remember that we're we're designing information. You know, we're not pushing pixels. And one of the ways um, I don't think this is that interesting. People tell me it's interesting, so I'm telling you. I hope you think it's interesting. One of the ways we've kind of forced that information design to happen is is doing a thing we call work designing in browser. So um, the guy there nearest the, nearest the screen with the big beard is a developer. The guy sat behind him near the window is what you might call a visual designer in sort of web design world. One of them is sketching in a sketchbook, and the other guy's coding that straight into the browser. So there's no Photoshop mock-ups. They're not making JPEGs and then sending it over a wall, and then the guy's building it. Or actually, the guy's going, well, I can't build that, actually, because you made it in Photoshop, and the web doesn't work like that. We're just doing it straight into the browser. Not all the time, but wherever possible, we are kind of designing in browser and going straight in. Um, and what that does is just, I think there's a rigor to it, and there's kind of an intellectual, you know, the designer has to describe how he wants that thing to look to the other person. There's, I think there's an, there's an interesting lesson there about sort of in intellectual rigor of design, and you're not just pushing it around and nudging it up a little bit. You know, you have to describe that relationship and make that decision for a reason, you know. So things like, why is that box pink? You know, you have to say, well, I want that box, oh, yeah, why is that pink? You know, as in Photoshop, you're just going, no, just make it pink, it looks great. You know, it's just, 
I think that's sort of interesting. Um, and that, I guess, sort of um, hints a little bit at this. We have a relentless focus on user needs. So that's the first thing we do is work out what's the user need. So, you know, in the bank holidays page, the user need is what's the next bank holiday. We work out what is the user need, not what is the government need or the minister need or the department need, what is the user need. This um, uh, little video, or little, it's actually a piece of paper stuck on a window in the office. And this came about because um, I had coffee with someone who used to work with FHK Henrion, who's another, um, he's born in Germany, but um, another sort of British designer that did lots of British uh, public service graphics and posters sort of after the war. And I was talking to this guy, and he said, yeah, yeah, we did lots of work for the government with uh, Henrion. And he always used to think that civil service, in the UK, that, that bit of government is called the civil service, the non-political bit. Um, he said he always thought the civil servants used to be forced to face the windows to be reminded that they were serving the people. And, uh, you know, this thought just stuck with me for a bit. I mean, that's interesting. And then, because we focus so relentlessly on users, we have all these meetings and people talk about user personas and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I sort of hate all that terminology, really. You know, um, I think you can get too religious about it and it gets in the way. But we were sort of sketching user personas. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, it's not right. And, and just got this piece of paper. I ripped a hole in the piece of paper and stuck that on the window of the meeting room and went, those are our users. Everyone in the country needs to use this website. Everyone of whatever age and, you know, everyone needs to use it. And it just kind of stuck there. We didn't really think more of it, but it's, it's the thing, the most Instagram thing in the office. Everyone that comes around gets, someone from the White House came around a few months ago and it was on the White House Twitter feed. Someone had, you know, Instagrammed this picture and posted it up. So, um, so this, this is another example of the old um, website. And going back to these kind of things we believe, one of the things we believe is that government should only do what only government can do. So we set the bank holidays, we set the tax rates, you know, we should tell you that stuff. We shouldn't tell you how to keep bees. Um, there are other people that can do that and should do that. <clears throat> this is one of the pages on the... I, I, I'm making this up now, but I think we probably lost about 80% of, of, of the DirectGov website because it was stuff like this that we think, you know, government shouldn't be telling you. You know, if you want to keep bees, that's great, but someone else should tell you that. There's this page which tells you um, what to do when it gets cold. <laughs> and, and if it gets really cold, you know, we don't think the government should tell you to pull on a pullover, really. You can... You can sort of work that out for yourself. Well, there's this one which um, we only found the other day, going back through the archives. We only found this one recently, but um, there's this page about waves. <coughs> <coughs> Understanding waves, and, and there's these little animated GIFs of waves, you know, different types of waves. I mean, it's fascinating, but, you know, we don't think the government should, you know, tell you this stuff, really. Someone else should tell you that. So... Government should only do what only government could do. I, mean, it's, I think it's quite a powerful statement anyway, actually, if you think about that, and government in a wider context. But that has formed a thing um, which we call our design principles. Um, there are ten of those. I would love to talk to you about all ten of those, but that is another talk for another conference. Um, they, uh, really, it was just an internal document that we made for ourselves, but because we sort of believe passionately in being open about all this stuff, we, you know, we stick it up on the web, and someone tweeted it, and then before we know it, it was a bit of a social media sensation, I guess. But please take a look at those. It's gov.uk forward slash design principles. They are an alpha. Um, we are going to change them. We're going to rewrite them. I think there's, there's some that we would change now. But those are our, our 10 design principles. And you can see, you can't quite see it because of the asterisks. You click on it and it sort of reveals. But the number one one is start with needs. And then underneath it says user needs, not government needs. Um, but uh, come and talk to me. Um, uh, like Michael said, uh, you know, I'm here and, until the weekend, so please come and talk to me about, about these or about any of this stuff. Um, I think what's interesting is those are, are ten design principles, um, and that kind of came about because we were supposed to issue uh, sort of web guidelines, like kind of a brand manual type thing in March last year, and I said, we can't do that because we haven't finished the work yet. We can't issue guidelines because we don't know... You don't know what typeface we're going to use or what colour we're going to do things. So I'm uncomfortable issuing guidelines. But let's issue some principles and, and stuff we believe. And they were backed up where possible with examples of, of what we've done. But we now are at a stage where we can, we can say, OK, we're going to use this typeface and we're going to blah, blah, blah. So we are making a thing called the Digital by Default Standard, which is not just about web design. It's about how to set up a team. It's about how to um, work with 
SMEs, small, medium enterprises. It's about how to get those contracts and you know, make sure you're making changes to your website every day rather than you know, once every couple of years. It's about all that stuff. It's launching soon in a couple of weeks. Um, it, that was an sort of internal alpha. There'll be a public beta in a couple of weeks, but please, please have a look at that. But I think, again, this is another talk for another conference, but what is interesting is all of, we can't make all these um, digital services and stuff by ourselves, so departments are going to have to make those, and we're going to help them. They will have to follow this standard, otherwise it won't go live. Um, and this standard says things like, you know, your code must be available in public, you should be, things like you should be blogging about what you're doing, you know, you should have done a public alpha and a beta. Um, governments, uh, government departments will have to have done that before the digital service you know, goes live. So there's an interesting story there for how we're getting an, an organisation in the UK, the civil service is 500,000 people, how we're kind of getting them to do design and, and digital by default and stuff. But that's a, a talk for another conference. So um, back to that um, screenshot that Margaret disliked so much, that had three typefaces on it, which was always crazy, but we were just kind of testing, you know, we were putting them up there and we'll sleep on it a bit and see what happens. We were always looking for one. Um, um, you know, one typeface is a sensible thing. And uh, I became a bit obsessed with the underground, and they obviously use Johnston, and they use this one typeface. It's kind of, they can't use one typeface everywhere. I mean, they use it on the massive signs outside the tube stations, and they use it, you know, they use it for the small print on the leaflets, and they use it for the stickers, and they use it on the signs, and, and um, they can't just have one, they must have more than one. Um, so I became a bit obsessed with it. Anyway, they do, they only use one. Um, it's fantastic. They do a fantastic job with it. Um, and we wanted something similar, really. We wanted one typeface that we could use across everything and would cope for all these different uses. Um, we have settled on a typeface called Transport, which, and this is just part of the circu circular story, it's almost a coincidence. Um, it, it's actually called New Transport, the one we're using, but Transport is the one that Margaret Calvert and Jock Kinney used on the road signs. Um, and she had mentioned it to me in one of our, our kind of discussions, and I was like, well, the, the road sign typeface is actually, as you, sort of as you'd expect, quite bold, you know, and it didn't really work online. And, and there wasn't a digital version, so we're using um, web fonts. And uh, there wasn't really a digital version, so it didn't work. So um, we looked at other ones. And then she started to work on a digital version with Henrik Kubel, who is a type designer from, uh, works in New York and works in London. They worked on a digital version, um, and we set the website in that, and then we tested it. We, you know, we do, uh, because we focus on the user so much, we do lots of user testing. We tested it, and it just kept coming up again and again and again as being the clearest one, the easiest one to read. And that's not just about the typeface, that's about spacing and, and so on and so on, but it kept clearly the, the ones set in new transport were easier to read. Um, this should have been obvious because they spent three or four years testing this typeface to make it easy to read on the motorways. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, so you can read it at 70 miles an hour when it's raining in the dark. It should have been obvious that it would be, you know, easy to read online too. Um, and they didn't have user testing then or labs or stuff like that. So what they did, um, you know, it's late 50s, what they did was they got loads of these um, road signs which Margaret or Jock would hand paint in gouache um, and then they would take them to an airfield and then they would drive pilots on the back of a truck at the road signs or sometimes they'd drive the road signs at the pilots and get them to shout when they could read it, you know. Uh, basically, which is um, so it should have been obvious that uh, it would it would work really well and read really well, but it does, um, and it looks great too. And there's a slight um, and this is a you know teeny weeny reason for using it, but there's a Britishness to it that's really nice. Um, and obviously the link is nice, but that, that really is a very small part of what we're doing. But so many of the pages, I mean the bank holiday page is one example. So many of those of our the pages on our site are just text. You know, it's, it's information design. That page about the bank holidays, I don't believe that page would be any more useful to you if it had a picture on it. Um, and I don't know what the picture would be. I mean, it would be a picture of someone on a bank holiday having a barbecue or something. You know, if you're Googling when is the next bank holiday, that picture doesn't aid you finding that out in any way whatsoever. So um, I'm just going to show you now some some bits of the work, basically. These are all um, grabs from the, from the website. I've kind of zoomed in on bits of them so you can just see the typeface. We ha these um, are quite interesting. They're called detailed guides. It's kind of e about EU legislation and so on like that. It's really the most complicated page we've got on the site, but they're, they're still um, much more simple than 
they were before. Everything's been rewritten too. There's a, there's a, a team of writers who rewrite all this content. Um, so again, that's very simple and very easy to understand. And there's a, on that, in the, within the design principles, there's a link to the style guide. I think it's gov.uk forward slash design principles forward slash style guide, but I'm not sure um, that you can find our sort of uh, writing style guide. There's a list of banned words on there, which are fantastic. So um, you are not allowed to say deliver unless you're delivering a baby or a pizza. Um, uh, you're not allowed to say tackle unless you're talking about a rugby match or a football match. So you, you can't have a piece of, of government content that says, we are tackling this and we're delivering this. The Ministry of Defence have the best pictures. They're really great at photography. And I do um, kind of image workshops with departments to try and, and you know, because we, we've made big pictures sort of a feature of their home pages now and, you know, try and get them to use better pictures. And I did one just the other week and said, the Ministry of Defence, you know, really great, they've got great pictures. And someone said, yeah, well, it's easy to take a picture of a warship, isn't it? And there was a lady from the Ministry of Defence in this um, workshop and she said, it is not easy to take a picture of a warship. <laughs> This is, we've got the G8 presidency at the moment. Um, you know, a year ago, that would have been a totally separate site with a, a whole different user experience language and design language. Now it's just a, a you know, section of our site, really. That's the um, Foreign Office one from yesterday. We had the US Secretary of State over. So and some more bits of bold. You know, we're starting to, to use that around the site. Um, we've got these things called topics. So you can find out what the government is doing on a thing. So, if you wanted to know, that's the field in my local school. Um, is the government going to sell that off or something? You, you, know, you would think, oh, I don't know, where do I find that out? Is that a Department of Education? Is that a Department of Environment? Is that, the Depart is that the Treasury? And what we say is you shouldn't have to understand government to find something out from government. You should just be able to go on and, and you know, look at the relevant topic and you know, find out what they're doing. And again, I think that sort of changes a little bit how you think about government and departments and you know, what they do when you start thinking of topics. Uh, it's all mobile. I always forget this, so just put this in at the end. Um, mobile first, responsive, whatever we are calling that this week, it does all that stuff. Um, like I said, I don't really like the terms and I think people get too religious too quickly about them, but what matters to me is if you are on the bus going for a job interview and you want to look up what the minimum wage is, should you be able to do that on the bus on your phone? Absolutely, yes, you should. Should you be able to do it on a Kindle or an iPad or whatever? Yes, absolutely, you should. And whatever we choose to call it is fine with me, but you should, that's the user need. You should be able to look that stuff up. So all of these government websites, it's all fully responsive and works on your mobile phone, so on and so on. Um, I think we're, we're able to do this work because we truly work in, in multidisciplinary teams. I mean, with a, you know, we don't have architects, product designers, but within the web context, we work in multidisciplinary teams this is sort of broadly what you would call the design team. There are developers in there, there are visual designers in there, there are interaction designers in there, there are developers who would, who, you know, for the technical ones amongst you, there are developers who write Ruby, they're kind of in that team. And what I think that does is it forces each other to have respect for the other one's discipline. It forces the visual designer to, un to a little bit understand you know, what the developer is doing. And it forces the developer to think, you know, when I'm going to put that text somewhere, I need to think about the placement of that. It sort of forces you to think about that stuff. We published a thing uh, at the end of last year called the Government Digital Strategy. And the, the headline of that is, Digital Services So Good That People Prefer to Use Them. Um, what's interesting about that is, is, you know, we're not really doing graphic design, web design, we're starting to do service design. So lots of the things in that digital by default standard you can't do by just redoing the website. It's not about putting a pretty front end on a thing. It's about looking at the service and making the service digital. And then if we really, truly focus on user need, we have to go all the way back to that service and, you know, is this a service, a thing only government, you know, can do? Should we be doing this? How do we, you know, how do we change this service? Um, we're also doing something, we're changing a culture. You know, these are um, Maz and Dai, the two web developers, they're at number 10, you know, helping them with stuff. Or, you know, if you're on Foursquare, I look at my Foursquare feed, there's all these people checking in at various government departments. There's a sort of a culture change. This is what we're mostly doing this year. Like in Martha's report, we've mostly done the fixing publishing bit. We're moving on to fixing transactions. This is what we're doing this year. We're doing 25 really big ones. We asked departments to, to pick their three biggest ones and we're, we're working on those. We're doing 25 of those this year. 
There's a digital efficiency report the government published that says if we transform um, all those transactions, not just 25, all of them, we will save one point, between 1.7 and 1.8 billion pounds each year. This is a map of all the governments around the world who have either been to visit us or who are coming to visit us in the near future. Um, and I, I, forgive me, I don't know whether they're all uh, country governments or they might be city governments, I'm not quite sure, but I notice that South Africa is on there. But these are, are people from around the world that are coming to see us and coming to see what we're doing. Um, we're incredibly open and you know, public about it. They're seeing what we're doing. Some people are just copying us, which is fantastic. But these, these people are, are coming, to see what we're, you know, coming to see what we're doing, find out more about it. Um, so maybe, just maybe, I'm not arrogant enough to say we're anywhere near as good as any of these other projects, but maybe, just maybe, we are getting close to, to replicating you know, that desire to do something that sort of sets a, sets a standard somehow and gets copied. And so we talked at the start about it being the best brief in Britain. You know, I think maybe we can start to ask, is this the world's most important design project? And again, you know, I don't know, I won't be the one to decide that. Um, I certainly think it's the world's best brief. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.